Well, hello everybody. Thank you for joining us for another one of our vlogs. Uh, my name is Gunnar. I'm one of the pastors here at Chapel Hill. And in these vlogs, what our goal is, is to dig a little bit deeper into what we talked about in our Sunday morning sermon. And this week, the topic of our message was the Holy Spirit, being filled with the Holy Spirit. And as we dug into that, I, we realized that it is still a very complex, kind of deep topic. And so maybe it would be helpful to, to go into it a little bit more. Uh, I shared a little bit in my uh, portion of the message where Pastor Ellis asked me some questions. Uh, I shared a little bit about my experience with the Holy Spirit. And uh, it was a, it's kind of a colorful experience. And I just thought I'd maybe share a little bit more about that, what my journey has been uh, in understanding the work of the Holy Spirit in my life and in the life of the church. Um, and so I thought I'd just walk through kind of my personal journey. And along the way, I can kind of share with you some resources and uh, different ways that I've approached studying this topic in the scriptures. So uh, I, I brought along with me several books uh, just to be able to mention them as we go along. Um, I'll try my best to put those down in uh, the description of this video so that you're able to access those at a different point. Uh, but I thought at least it would be helpful to mention some of these resources so that uh, if you wanted to dig deeper in a particular aspect of what I share, uh, you could do so. Obviously, the best resource that we have is the Bible. It's the scriptures. And uh, you can't go wrong with just digging deep into God's word and asking, Lord, what do you say about the gift of the Spirit? What do you say about spiritual gifts? And then studying that. Uh, in fact, all the books that I have with me today um, are an attempt at understanding uh, the scriptures and then applying them to our current context. So uh, I just want to commend to you, um, spend some time in the book of Acts, spend some time in the book of 1 Corinthians, um, spend some time in John 3, understanding what Jesus says about being born again by the Holy Spirit. Uh, there are so many great passages if you just search um, on a Bible website or you go in the back of your Bible to the concordance and look up the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, uh, there's all sorts of things that you can study and start piecing some things together yourself as you journey through and uh, ask yourself, how does the Holy Spirit want to work in my life and the life of our church? So I'll just start off by saying, Pastor Ellis shared a little bit about my, uh, my time in the Pentecostal movement. Um, that was actually not until my junior high and high school years of my childhood uh, where I was attending that church. Uh, before that, my family um, church hopped and shopped, and my folks were trying their best to, to find the best place for us to land, to grow in our faith, um, and church can get messy sometimes. And so uh, we, we navigated that, went to a number of different churches, non-denominational, Bible, Baptist, um, maybe even an occasional Lutheran or, or those sorts of things. Um, I attended Catholic Mass a handful of times with my grandmother. Uh, and just as I grew up, I got to see different facets of the Christian church. And in my junior high years and my high school years, um, I got to spend some time in an Assemblies of God church. Um, now, there's wonderful Assemblies of God churches, and in fact, the church that I grew up in was a wonderful church with loving people in it, and they wanted me to grow and, and deepen in my, my faith. Uh, but as I was attending this church and youth group with some of my friends, uh, we went to some of the summer camps and the, the local conferences and participated in those. And for me, those local conferences and camps, that sort of thing, was really where I started seeing the most uh, spiritual phenomena. And uh, in particular, where I came into contact with um, what they call the doctrine of the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And for uh, the Pentecostal movement, because of the way that it sprung up, uh, they really taught this doctrine of a second grace of the Holy Spirit, where it's after we get saved, we believe in Jesus, we come to Christ, and uh, after that point, we can have a secondary uh, 
blessing, a secondary experience of God's Spirit in our life, and that is called the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Where they arrived at this is reading through the book of Acts and noticing that uh, a number of times throughout the book of Acts that there is this kind of impartation of the Holy Spirit. And uh, that with that impartation of the Holy Spirit, that there is this sort of physical evidence of speaking in tongues. And uh, with that evidence of speaking in tongues, um, you start to pick, kind of make a connection between um, receiving the Holy Spirit and speaking in tongues, that they, they really seem like they may be the same thing. So as they studied that and worked that out in Pentecostalism, the, a lot of times the way that it's articulated is that we should all earnestly seek the baptism of the Holy Spirit and that the initial physical evidence of the baptism of the Holy Spirit is speaking in tongues. So if you grew up in a tradition like this, be it uh, Assemblies of God, Foursquare, this sort of thing, um, you probably realize just how important speaking in tongues was to understanding the work of the Holy Spirit. It was almost like uh, if you wanted to know if you had the Holy Spirit working in your life, well, then you should just, just check if you're speaking in tongues or not, that those things are almost synonymous. And so what ends up happening is that gift gets elevated uh, to a higher level. So I remember when I was going through uh, a, a camp, um, I think it was maybe in eighth grade, uh, maybe seventh grade, yeah, eighth grade, and uh, we went to this camp and there was a very dynamic speaker that came up from California. And uh, as one of the pastors in, in the AG church that I knew said, um, by the time that you kind of got up from California, uh, the, the movement of Pentecostalism made its way up into the Northwest. It almost kind of became diet Pentecostal <laughs> because uh, it, it just kind of calmed down in a lot of circles. That's not always the case. But at least for my experience, uh, being in an AG church, these sorts of things were highlighted uh, from time to time, and we saw different phenomena, but uh, it wasn't like how it was at summer camp. And when I went to summer camp, there was, this, again, this dynamic speaker from California, uh, and I noticed that when he would preach, he would kind of intermittently sometimes speak in tongues as he preached along. And I, had, I don't think I had a, at that point really heard somebody speak in tongues on mic. Uh, that was sort of a new thing for me. Um, and so that, was, that caught me off guard as, as, a, as a young person, as a kid, really. Um, and then, uh, then what they called us to do was to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We'd already had all these very emotive, um, expressive, dynamic times of worship, particularly in the, the singing time and raising our hands and these sorts of these, these things, but also kind of lots of feelings, lots of crying, uh, lots of, uh, folks on the floor, that kind of a thing. And... Uh, at, toward the end of the camp, though, it, they, they said it's, it's time for you to seek this baptism of the Holy Spirit and to speak in tongues. And so they set up sort of a tunnel of people where they had a line of, of leaders uh, facing another line of leaders. And then we'd walk through kind of like, uh, you know, the basketball games, especially if your kids did upward basketball <laughs> and all the kids run through and you've got kind of all everybody's got their hands up kind of a deal. And you run through that tunnel and then you go out and everybody's clapping for you. Um, that's kind of the idea. But they were all praying over us with the expectation that when we go in, we're speaking our own language, English, and that we would come out of that tunnel having been prayed for speaking in tongues. So there's a high level of anticipation high level of expectation, um, high level of pressure. Uh, it, it, I, I do not commend <laughs> these sorts of practices. I don't see them in the scriptures, but I was still obviously as, as a kid trying to make sense of all this. So I went through the tunnel, I went in speaking in English, and I came out of the tunnel speaking in English. Um, and I remember praying something along the lines of, you know, if God, if you want me to speak in tongues, if you want me to have an extra experience of the Holy Spirit, if you want this for me, I'll have it. I'll take it. 
And um, so it wasn't a seeking, it wasn't necessarily desiring at that point, it was just trying to make sense of it and being open to it. So I didn't speak in tongues, but I had a few other friends who did. Um, some of those friends are no longer walking with the Lord. And uh, that was really fascinating for me to watch as the years kind of uh, went on. So I remember going back to my cabin after that camp experience. I had had a very emotional experience of worship and really felt like a greater zeal for God, a greater belief in him. Yet I was still had this, this concern and um, even fear about what I had gone through. So I remember back then I, I grabbed my little study Bible, my NIV study Bible, and I dug into, you know, some of these passages about speaking in tongues. And I wanted to get to the bottom of it. And what I was really shocked about as I read the passage about tongues, particularly in chapter 12 and chapter 14 of 1 Corinthians, was that it was just one of many gifts. It still seemed, seemed like it was listed as a valuable gift. I mean, Paul said, I'm, I'm grateful that I speak in tongues more than you all. But it really seemed to me that it's just one of the gifts and that actually the, the Corinthian church had elevated this really to a high level, like the church that I had been attending. And I found that really interesting. And there was something to that, and I'm just going to put a pin in that, because I think there's more to unpack from this connection between the Corinthians and, uh, and uh, hyper-charismatic practice. But reading through uh, 1 Corinthians, I realized it's one of the gifts, and that there's this understanding, all do not speak in tongues, do they? And the implied answer, and, and that's one of a series of questions from the Apostle Paul, the implied answer is no, because he says not all are uh, prophets, are they? <laughs> not all have the gift of healing, do they? And he kind of goes through this list, and one of the questions is about tongues. So number one, I realize tongues is just one of many gifts, and number two, not everybody gets the gift of tongues. And so I was, I was trying to piece that whole thing together. So uh, fast forward a little bit, I ended up having this big rebellious stage in my life. I've shared about this in, in a sermon or two here at Chapel Hill, but a rebellious stage in my faith life where I turned away from God, uh, kind of. It was more that I, I justified my lifestyle and sinful decisions that God wanted me to do them. And, uh, and I, I really was not following God and I was living deeply in sin and had a lot of guilt, a lot of sorrow, a lot of brokenness. And uh, I ended up becoming convicted of that sin when my parents found out all the different ways that I was being rebellious. And uh, I um, ended up, by the grace of God, being drawn to my knees and giving my life to the Lord. And that was really my big conversion moment. That was in my high school years. Uh, some of you may have had a similar rebellious high school time and been drawn to the Lord. Uh, but I was, I was drawn to, to the Lord, and I had this new hunger for Scripture that I had never had before, uh, and this hunger for prayer and to be closer to God, to give up my sin, uh, to walk in a new way, because I had, I had said, Lord, I believe that Jesus died for my sins. He rose from the dead. Would you uh, live your life through me? Would you help me to live a new life? And so he did, and I was hungry for the Word. And so I started to uh, attend a Bible church that, because I wanted a church that really taught me the Bible. I was hungry for the Bible. I started uh, listening to sermons. Like I, I was almost a sermon addict. <laughs> I listened to, in particular, uh, two teachers that really shaped me, uh, John MacArthur and Charles Stanley. And I'll actually mention a book here in a minute um, by John MacArthur that I think is really interesting. Uh, but I got the MacArthur Study Bible in the New American Standard Version, and I dug into that thing. I still have it on my desk. It's beat up. I still like using it from time to time. I, I don't agree with all of it uh, by any stretch of the imagination as I've grown and, and studied the Bible for myself, but there's still a lot of good in it. Anyway, I started studying uh, uh, under MacArthur's sermons. And as I did that, um, I started to realize this guy really thinks that tongues have ceased. And um, you read about that in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. It says, love never ends, verse 8, 
As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. And so what you have there, <clears throat> excuse me, is the word cease, um, cessation, the cessation of tongues in particular. And John MacArthur uh, wrote a book, I don't have it in my stack today, um, because he's done a, a, since done an updated version of it that I'll mention in a little bit. But he wrote a book called Charismatic Chaos. And I got a, uh, I got a copy of that little paperback book uh, that he had written, particularly around the time of, of a number of revivals that broke out in California and his kind of response uh, to this revivalism. And different churches he had, he had gone to and observed and uh, different people that uh, had shared their stories with him. And as I read through those stories, they were kind of the most uh, big caricatures of charismatic practice. Um, and yet it was shocking to me. And I, and I bought into a lot of what he taught. Um, cessationism is the belief that the miraculous gifts of the New Testament, the miraculous spiritual gifts of the New Testament have ceased. So that's cessationism. And I bought wholesale into this. I thought, yes, we have the scriptures are sufficient. Uh, the canon of scripture, scripture, that is the collection of the books of the Bible, the canon of scripture has been closed. We read at the end of Revelation that nothing ought to be added to this book, um, stuff like that. And the, the perfect has come in the revelation of God, particularly in the New Testament, that the apostles and prophets have laid the foundation uh, of the church on Christ and so we don't really need these what are called revelatory gifts. And so a lot of times those gifts, the, the little uh, grouping of them is things like prophecy, uh, apostleship for sure, uh, uh, speaking in tongues and interpretation of tongues, of course, uh, miracles and healings and this sort of thing. Cessationists don't believe that all the gifts have ceased. They believe only that those more miraculous gifts that were especially tied to the, the ministry of the apostles have ceased. So that's cessationism in a nutshell. And I bought into this. Um, and as I was reading the Bible, I thought, yes, I do see a lot of those points that they are raising, that we have a complete satisfactory uh, canon of scripture that we have the prophetic word as it's as it said in first Peter uh, more sure than any of the uh, experiences that we could possibly have so I became increasingly a uh, cessationist and um, but what I started to think back on as I read the Bible there doesn't really seem to be any indication in the New Testament that that's going to really happen that these other gifts are just going to completely go away um, until uh, until really the return of Christ and so I still wasn't fully even though I bought in wholesale there was still this little twinge of doubt that maybe I, I wasn't understanding uh, understanding the work of the Holy Spirit like uh, like the scriptures taught it um, besides, it seems like there's so much uh, information that the Holy Spirit in the scriptures gave to us about how to use spiritual gifts like that, particularly in 1 Corinthians, but elsewhere, that it, it really seemed to me that that's odd that he would give us all of that information and then not have us use it. Um, the other piece that was missing for me was as I read about the work of God in the life of a believer, the power we're supposed to experience, uh, the, and really the kind of the emotive aspect of, of the Christian life, um, the affections, um, stuff like that. As I was reading the Bible, I thought, that's, that's really missing uh, in the cessationist circles in which I'm living. Uh, there's, there's something missing there. So one of my friends told me about uh, another pastor who was uh, writing books and had been for a while and whose preaching had really blessed him. And his name was John Piper. John Piper wrote the book, Desiring God. That's kind of his magnum opus. And uh, in that book, he talked a lot about the emotive, passionate, affectionate uh, aspect of the Christian life, that we should desire God, that delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart kind of all the emotive language of the Psalms. And he was really leaning into that. And his line was 
God is most glorified in you when you are most satisfied in him. And that was like a mind-blowing principle for me uh, to, to hear that said, that, that God actually desires my happiness in him. And that was just explosive. And it really uh, brought new life to my spiritual, my spiritual life. What was fascinating about Piper is Piper is not a cessationist. He is what we call a continuationist. Um, if the cessationists believe that the sign gifts, as they're called, ceased in the completion of the New Testament, continuationists believe the opposite, that the sign gifts continued beyond the time of the apostles. And he taught on uh, the Holy Spirit, but his teaching, similar to MacArthur, was that when we believe in Jesus, we are baptized in the Holy Spirit. Uh, if you read once again in uh, uh, in in chapter twelve um, of First Corinthians verse eleven, it says, "All these gifts are empowered by one and the same Spirit, who apportions to each one individually as He wills. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ." And this is the real kicker for me. For in one spirit, we were all baptized into one body. So if we're talking about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, we are baptized in the Holy Spirit when we are brought into Christ's body. And so the baptism of the Holy Spirit happens at salvation. And that verse was very impactful for me, both as I was a cessationist and as I flirted with the idea of continuationism uh, and some of these other streams like John Piper's. Both believed in these two streams that uh, the baptism of the Holy Spirit is not a second uh, experience after salvation, but it actually happens at the time that we place our trust in Jesus Christ. So Piper was this different kind of continuationist than the Pentecostals that I had grown up with. And as I began to think about uh, what my beliefs were about the Holy Spirit, I thought, hmm, that's very fascinating because I wasn't completely satisfied with the answer that a lot of these gifts just simply disappeared because we don't really have any indication in the New Testament that that's going to happen. I understand the argument and the connection of cessationism that says, well, what, we don't need these revelatory gifts because we have the scriptures, but how is healing a revelatory gift? How are miracles a revelatory gift? Um, and is our tongues really a revelatory gift? And what does that mean, revelatory? I understand that we have the complete and sufficient revelation of God in the Bible, but what does it mean that these gifts were revelatory? And how does, does the Bible ever make the connection between the gifts and the closing of the canon? And I wasn't seeing that that happened. I wasn't seeing that. Uh, as I read through the scriptures. So as I learned uh, from Piper, um, I started realizing that for him, he also had the same critique of kind of the hardcore, um, more classical Pentecostalism, uh, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Um, well, that happens, the Pentecostals say that's a secondary experience after salvation. Piper says, I don't see that in the Bible. Uh, and then secondly, that the initial physical evidence of that baptism of the Spirit, Spirit baptism, is speaking in tongues. Piper also said, I don't see that either. But what Piper taught, and this was my first exposure to this, is we're all baptized in the Holy Spirit into the body of Christ when we come to faith in Jesus. But then as we go throughout our Christian life, that we can continue to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And so this is where we get to uh, Ephesians chapter 5, which we looked at this last Sunday, which says, don't get drunk with wine, for that's debauchery, but be filled, be constantly filled in the Greek with the Spirit. And so I was wrestling through that. I thought that is maybe one of the most biblical answers that I have ever heard. And once again, the greatest argument for uh, cessationism comes from 1 Corinthians 13, 8, that prophecies will pass away, knowledge will pass away, tongues will cease, uh, 
Uh, but when the, and it says, for we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. When I was a child, I spoke like a child, thought like a child, reasoned like a child. But when I became a man, I gave up childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I've been fully known. So now faith, hope, and love abide these three, but the greatest of these is love. You may have heard that right at a wedding. I think it's not by accident that chapter 13 of 1 Corinthians is sandwiched between 12 and 14. And when we talk about spiritual gifts uh, in 12 and 14, we can't forget the connection uh, of love and the importance of the gifts are for love, to love God and to love others. But back to this whole idea of tongues ceasing in particular, um, what's interesting about that passage is it says that all of that's going to go away when the perfect comes. And as you continue to read about seeing in a mirror dimly, but then face to face, what could Paul be talking about but the return of Christ and the establishing of his kingdom? Um, it seems to me that tongues weren't going to cease when the canon was closed. That does, that's never said in here. Uh, but when the perfect comes, and the perfect comes when Jesus returns. So cessationism started to fall apart for me, for me when I uh, started to study some of these things and look at those Bible verses a little bit more closely, and as I looked at the, the New Testament as a whole and started to question some of that. So Piper was really uh, kind of the, the one that got me on this track. One of Piper's buddies wrote a book. Uh, his name is Wayne Grudem. This, this gentleman uh, who is a professor, one of the, the greatest evangelical minds right now, uh, he wrote a book uh, on systematic theology. There's a lot of systematic theologies out there. This has really become kind of the standard for evangelicals recently, um, but his systematic theology is really quite a, a hefty work, as you can see. He also wrote a, a, a condensed version called Bible Doctrine. So if you want to look that one up, Wayne Grudem, Bible Doctrine. Uh, but my church that I was at, that was a cessationist church, getting back to my story. Um, the church that I was at, uh, they were using this resource as a men's theology study. And as we worked our way through uh, this resource, um, there is a section on the work of the Holy Spirit. And in this work of the Holy Spirit section, uh, he unpacks... Uh, even deeper, the same view as Piper of continuationism, the continuation of spiritual gifts, but also talks about how those can operate biblically. And this is really when my cessationism started coming unglued. And that happens for a lot of folks. When you start to read and understand how the Bible works out spiritual gifts, um, cessationism can start to come unglued. And you start to realize, wow, um, the Bible calls me to be filled with the Holy Spirit. It actually calls me to earnestly desire spiritual gifts. And so, yes, the Holy Spirit sovereignly apportions out spiritual gifts, both at our conversion and, and along the way during our, our journey with the Lord. But he also calls us to the responsibility of seeking after gifts, especially gifts that can be used to love God and love others. And so you start reading these commands and these calls to not quench the Holy Spirit is another command. You start reading through these things and you say, well, I feel like we're not really obeying those commands. We're not really following those teachings of scripture. And so Grudem does an amazing job of walking through all of the biblical spiritual gifts and unpacking how we understand them biblically. And he also does a great job of teaching on the filling of the Holy Spirit. And so that was when I started flirting with continuationism. And uh, then before I know it, I ended up here at Chapel Hill. And uh, here at Chapel Hill, I was given the space, like I mentioned this last Sunday, to really study um, each side of the issue and try to make sense where I landed. That brought me to um, the time at Alpha, as I shared with, and Al Alpha, I think, does a phenomenal job of introducing who the Holy Spirit is, what the Holy Spirit does, and how to be filled 
with the Holy Spirit. There are three Alpha Talks uh, that you can hear if you come to our Alpha course. We're going to be running, there's one running right now, uh, but there's another one starting up in January. And if you attend that Alpha course, you'll get to hear those three talks as part of the weekend. Uh, but at that weekend, hearing that and saying, you know what, I think I've really arrived at the place where I know I need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Um, I need to earnestly desire spiritual gifts and not quench the Holy Spirit in my life. Follow those commands. And so I want to tell the Lord, Lord, I want you to fill me with the Holy Spirit. Would you give me the gifts that you, des that you know are best for me? And uh, would you um, grant me the grace not to quench the Spirit in my life? And so coming into that space um, of Alpha, I again, that's when I kind of had that initial um, uh, real feeling of, of the Holy Spirit being present with me. And things like that, little kind of remnants of that had happened before. Even thinking back to my Pentecostal days, um, I had sensed the Holy Spirit kind of in that room and working. Um, I'm not going to say that all of that was bad because it wasn't. Uh, there was a lot of valuable things that I got out of that experience in Pentecostalism. I'm also not going to say that my time in that Bible church was bad because that was also really helpful. It really grounded me and rooted me. And then later on, coming to the position that I did, I think it all came together um, and God really used that. But I had had initial kind of senses that maybe I would speak in tongues and that God, God wanted to do that in my life. And um, so even after Alpha, I remember going to my life group and spending time in prayer and kind of getting this welled up, welled up feeling that maybe I would speak in tongues. And, and so there were little promptings that the Holy Spirit was giving me to say, you know, this might be coming your way. And so that's, I studied more and more. And that's when I found an author named Sam Storms. Uh, Sam Storms is a, a, a phenomenal Christian thinker. He's also kind of cut from a similar cloth as Wayne Grudem and John Piper. But Sam Storms has leaned into this more uh, than anybody from the continuationist point of view as an evangelical and as a reformed guy too, like us at Chapel Hill. And so uh, reading Sam Storms was really helpful, watching some of his talks. And it was actually after I watched some of his talks, read some of the, his stuff, uh, that I had that morning that I shared about when I was praying and was so overcome with the presence of God and began uh, to speak in tongues. So uh, at that point, I really wanted to get to the bottom of, you know, where do I fall on this continuation cessationism spectrum? And what do I think about speaking in tongues? So a couple more books. Uh, so I went back, uh, first of all, Sam Storms, he released this one pretty recently, but it's kind of a compilation of a lot of his work that he's done. Understanding Spiritual Gifts, A Comprehensive Guide, Sam Storms. A phenomenal book. Uh, there's a lot of people who uh, recommend it, like Max Lucado, um, folks like that that you may be familiar with. But Sam Storms, uh, he does a phenomenal job of unpacking uh, a really practical continuationist perspective. At the same time, I didn't want to forget uh, my roots, if you will, and, and not really hear out the cessationist point of view and uh, the dangers that, come, that, that can come from going full out on, on, uh, on the spiritual gifts side. Uh, John MacArthur released a book called Strange Fire, The Danger of Offending the Holy Spirit with counterfeit worship. Now what's fascinating is reading these side by side. If you're a big reader, um, reading these side by side will be very edifying for you, challenging, but edifying. Um, it's kind of like being in college and reading the different views on stuff and you may disagree with elements of each, but you end up, end up pulling a lot of, of really valuable content. I think that um, these are kind of the two sides of the coin and they're, they really reflect well uh, the two views. And so I'd commend these to you. Uh, what's really helpful in the back of MacArthur's book in particular is this appendix where he kind of walks through church history and he argues from church history that the sign gifts ceased. And so uh, there's some great, great stuff. Voices from church history is what it's called. Chrysostom, Augustine, Luther, John Calvin, John Owen, all these folks uh, that you can kind of start reading, Jonathan Edwards, Spurgeon, and so on. And you can, you can kind of hear that his argument for cessationism from church history, that's really helpful. It also demonstrates the abuses that have happened in the Pentecostal and charismatic streams that are worth looking into.
Um, this, reading this book, even after my spiritual experiences that I've had has really grounded me. Um, it's given me greater sensitivity to people that have maybe been bit, kind of beat up in these traditions, uh, the more uh, charismatic and Pentecostal traditions, um, and just kind of warned me a little bit of how things can get extreme. Uh, real quickly, I'm sitting here in Pastor Mark's office because uh, it has a fireplace, um, which then I realized I don't need a fireplace because Mark keeps his office, Pastor Mark keeps his office at about 85 degrees or something like that. Anyway, uh, but the, the fireplace, I think, is a great analogy. I was just talking with a member of our church who shared this with me um, about how to operate within the spiritual gifts. And she said, you got to keep the fire in the fireplace. I love that analogy. You have to keep the fire and the excitement and, uh, and really the uh, eccentricities of, of spiritual experiences. Um, and in that aspect of it, you, you want to have that alive, but it has to be done decently and in good order. Um, and that's where the fireplace comes into play. And unfortunately, when fire gets out of the fireplace, it burns people and it can burn houses down and destroy lives. Um, and that's what you see when the fire gets out of the fireplace, when um, the gifts become more important to us than the giver of those gifts, honoring him, submitting to him, and, and so on. Uh, this is what 1 Corinthians has to say about that. It says, So my brothers, earnestly desire to prophesy and don't forbid speaking in tongues, but all things should be done decently and in order. And I think that in lies the balance. That in lies the balance. I would Sam Storms would agree with that. Uh, he would agree with that everything must be decently in good order. But he's definitely more on the let's focus on the fire. Uh, John MacArthur's let's focus on the fireplace. <laughs> and so between the two of them, I think you can get a good understanding and a balanced perspective that really gets to the heart of, of these two verses. Um, if you want kind of the, the history of uh, continuationism and to hear from Sam Storms on how to make sense of the history of that, uh, of the church history and does, do the gifts continue and stuff like that, uh, he also has a section called Tongues in Early Christianity. Um, and he has this a two-parter in his book, The Language of Heaven. Now this gift, this book is all about the gift of tongues but he can't help himself but defend uh, continuationism and in the back talk about tongues in early Christian history, parts one and part two, and uh, kind of share some encouraging testimonies of how people have experienced tongues in their life. And that really gets, it's kind of a, a, a response in a, in a way to MacArthur's appendix at the end with church history. There's some of that actually, a, a pretty good deal of it. Um, in, uh, in understanding the spiritual gifts, but this is much more rooted in the future. It's not so much looking at um, what happened in the past, it's how do we steward the gifts in the present and in the future and kind of look out what could be the future um, for uh, the charismatic renewal in the church. And MacArthur also writes an, uh, a letter to his continuationist friends and kind of urges them to be careful about some things. Uh, with that whole regard to the whole thing about keeping the fire in the fireplace, I also read another great book if you just don't have enough books to read. But what I really, why I'm sharing these books with you is I'm hoping that you'll latch on to one or maybe two, pick them up, work through them, look at the scriptures for yourself, and be edified. Um, so don't feel like you have to read all these unless you're really kind of obsessed about getting to the bottom of this like I was. Uh, that's kind of how my personality is. I find a topic and I dig and I want to get to the bottom of it. Um, and so if you're like me, you may want to you may want to read a bunch of these. But another book that came out kind of in the vein of MacArthur is by a guy named Costi Hinn. And the name Hinn may be familiar to you because he is the nephew of Benny Hinn, the televangelist, uh, who really, um, talk about taking the fire out of the fireplace. <laughs> uh, I don't want to talk too much about it, but uh, Costi Hinn unpacks the abuses of the prosperity gospel which what all of these people that I read have in common is that they believe that uh, the prosperity gospel, the health and wealth gospel that says if you are faithful that you're gonna have all, you're gonna, um, you're gonna get rich and you're gonna never get sick, um, any of that kind of stuff, um, all of them would agree that that's not true. 
Um, but he wrote a book on the prosperity gospel and his experience working under his uncle and seeing the abuses and how he came out of that. He landed as a cessationist, and I understand that coming out of what he came out of. Uh, but he is a very helpful uh, voice in understanding what happens when we take the fire out of the fireplace and abuses happen and we uh, walk away from what God's word teaches on these subjects. So when it comes to speaking in tongues, if you've never spoken in tongues, uh, but you want to understand, uh, or if you do speak in tongues and you want to get to know what that gift is better, um, if God's given you that gift at this time, then The Language of Heaven by Sam Storms, I highly commend. Um, there's also a, another book that I will include as a resource below that really helped me to understand the gift of speaking in tongues uh, by Jack Hayford, I believe it was. And um, these books helped me after I began to speak in tongues to say, is this legitimate? Uh, how do I make sense of this? How do I use it well? Um, what is that experience really supposed to be like? And it's a bizarre thing to try to explain to people. Uh, but these guys do a great job. Um, the other book is much more practical, down to earth. This is much more um, understanding comprehensively, kind of more theoretically, what tongues is all about. So those are all my books. That is my experience. That's where I've landed at this point is uh, on most things, I, I'm kind of in the middle. I want to hold things in tension. I want to hold, and so I, I really say my position is the, the fire in the fireplace. I want the fire and I want the fireplace. Uh, those are really good. Another part of my position is, you know, today uh, the rain stopped and we don't really know when it's going to pick up again. This is another good illustration, I think. We don't know when it's going to pick up again and we have our weather apps and our meteorologist friends are really working their tails off to try to tell us when it's going to rain or not rain uh, but a few days ago i saw a time that there's a few hours that i thought it wasn't going to rain and my wife and i went out to walk i didn't bring a jacket and i thought i'll be totally fine and by the time i got home i was soaked because the app was wrong um, you don't really know when the rainfall is going to come uh, but it, it's going to it's going to come at, at times you don't expect perhaps and I also believe that's how the Holy Spirit works based on John 3. And so there are going to be waves. There are going to, in our church life, in our personal life, uh, I really believe that there are times when the Holy Spirit rains down, uh, like, the, like the hymn, like the, the gospel hymn, Holy Spirit rain down. Uh, we're, we're seeking that, and we should always be seeking it. But when God says, yes, here, here you are, here's more of the experience of the Holy Spirit, and that comes your way. And then there are times when the rain doesn't come for a little while. Um, and then there are times when it drizzles. And all of that is, is totally okay. The Bible uses the imagery of the wind in uh, John 3. Jesus does himself, talking to Nicodemus. He says that the wind blows where it will, and we don't know where it comes from or where it's going. And such is uh, as, as those who are born of the Spirit. And so, uh, fire in the fireplace and uh, also, let, let's just be uh, understanding that God is sovereign, that his spirit is sovereign, that he works when he will, and uh, we, are, we get to go along for the ride and, and find benefit from it. One last thing before I, I close up here. Uh, I shared in the message with Pastor Ellis this week when he interviewed me uh, about my position of open yet discerning open to the surprising work of the Holy Spirit, yet discerning according to the word of God. That might kind of put it all into, into one thing, the rain, the fire, uh, my experiences, continuation, cessation, and all that, those different themes already, not yet. Um, I think I would really sum everything up in open yet discerning. I stole that too uh, from a book by Ken Boa, it's the last book. But Ken Boa is my favorite theologian of all time favorite teacher uh, uh, in the church over the years, and I've so benefited from him. Um, even sent him an email one time, and he really helped me process through some things. Um, really great man, but he wrote a book called Conformed to His Image, and in this book, Biblical and Practical Approaches to Spiritual Formation, uh, he unpacks uh, the open yet discerning position uh, in his spirit-filled spirituality. So I commend that to you as well. Uh, we want to be uh, at Chapel Hill. I, I really believe this, and I, all of us pastors are on the same page about this. Uh, we want to be open to the surprising work of the Holy Spirit, and yet dis discerning every experience. That's another thing that the Bible calls us to do, 
to discern prophecies, to discern spirits, uh, to discern uh, discern it, all the things that we experience in this life according to Scripture, because the Spirit gave us this book. Uh, it says in Second Timothy chapter three that all Scripture is God breathed, given by inspiration of God, and is profitable for teaching and correction, and training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, lacking in no good thing. And so this word is sufficient, and the Holy Spirit uh, helps us to understand this word, apply this word, and he gives us gifts and experiences of his grace according to the word. And so every time we experience something, it, it, let's go back to scripture, go back to scripture. There's no better way to uh, gin up and, and empower your walk with the Lord, your prayer life, your experience of the Holy Spirit, than getting filled with this book. There is a, a very close uh, connection between letting the word of Christ dwell richly within us and being filled with the Holy Spirit. Those things really happen a lot of times together. And so um, I just encourage us to be open to the surprising work of the Holy Spirit, yet discerning according to the word of God. To keep the fire in the fireplace and anticipate when the rain might fall, uh, trust in the Lord that he knows when it's best for us uh, to experience the reign of the Holy Spirit in fuller measure. So I hope this is helpful to you. Uh, maybe you could share a little bit of your journey if you want to write me a note or put something in the comments. Uh, if you have other questions about the Holy Spirit and you want me to reach out to you, you can, you can also share that in the comments. Uh, if this video and my story was helpful, you can feel free to share that. Thank you so much for listening and spending so much time with me. And uh, I really hope that the Lord blesses you with a greater understanding of his word, a, a deeper experience of his spirit so that you may be drawn in greater closeness to him, to delight in him, desire him, to know him and make him known. So the Lord bless you. Thank you so much.